is a house that I can never refuse an invitation to. And this is a personality that I can never resist talking about. Uh, in our family, he has enjoyed cult status for the past three generations at least. He could do no wrong in the eyes of my father or my grandfather. And whenever I brought up any topic that was even remotely controversial about Sir C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer, I would be told, just think about the amount of good that he did and then leave the rest aside. All that is immaterial, most of it is speculative, but a lot of the good that he did was real and we have all lived on to enjoy the benefits of what, whatever he did for us. And so uh, this morning my dad wanted to come but then uh, he got held up for certain reasons so he couldn't come. But he never comes for any talks of mine. This was one that he really wanted to be here for, so it's a pity that he is not here. Uh, this is a personality that has been very well documented. In fact, the best possible biography on Sir CP is by Dr. Saroja Sundararajan, CP and Autobiography, which is a wonderful uh, book which gives you every detail about his life. His own granddaughter, Sakuntala Jagannathan, wrote a book, Sir C.P. Remember. Then we got a number of references. His, own, his secretary, Chidambaraya, if I am not mistaken, I think he wrote the first biography. It was not a biography, it was more a personal account of Sir C.P. as seen from very close quarters. And then we've had a number of other records. For instance, Lord Wavell's Viceroy's Journal contains a number of references to Sir C.P. And he is one of the few Indians that Wavell writes warmly about. Uh, when you read the biography, you realize that he did not write very warmly about others with good reasons. But that is something that I would leave you to read the biography in detail and then uh, get the, the uh, stories from. Ian Copeland in his Princess in the Endgame of the Empire also writes about Sir C.P.'s role as the advisor to the Chamber of Princes and uh, as the Divan of Travancore. There's a lot. But what is very interesting is that it is invariably his Travancore years that get the maximum publicity. And what is largely forgotten, though not in the biography by Dr. Saroja, that his Madras years are largely forgotten by everybody else. They kind of just brush that aside. Even Sridhar Menon in his Triumph and Tragedy in Travancore talks largely about Sir C.P.'s years there and kind of overlooks the achievements that he had earlier, that he had, you know, the fast rise that he had in Madras city. So this is a presentation that essentially looks at that. I have relied, as I said, on Dr. Saroja's biography, on Shakuntala Jagannathan's book, and on a few other references that I have. Pamal Samandam Mudaliya's Nadaga Mede in neighborhood, where he writes in detail about Sir C.P.'s role in the Suguna Vilasa Sabha, then My Lapo Club, the Music Academy archives, which incidentally have quite a bit about Sir C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer's role in the initial years of the Music Academy and Kalki's writings and so on. So, first of all, the place that we are here, as Dr. Nandita said, the Grove, I think one of the last surviving historic residences of Madras. Uh, in 19, uh, sorry, in 2008, I wrote this book, 50 Historic Residences of Chennai. Today, if that book were to be written, it would be five historic residences of Chennai. In the course of eight years, we had lost 45 of those buildings. And only one, five of them survive, and this is one of those glorious five. Soon, you are going to have a very valuable, not piece of real estate, but built heritage in your hand. <laughs> so, uh, the house, as she mentioned, goes back far before Sir C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer. So, it goes back to the time of John Bruce Norton, and uh, the father of Early Norton. And the house, incidentally, was even bigger. The property was much bigger than what it is today. And it was known as the Baobab, which is a tree that is really not endemic to India, but then it was brought here over a period, over, over generations. And a part of the Baobab really became the growth. The other part, which was known as Senampet Gardens, is what divides this property from H.D. Raja Street and other places on the other side. And that happened to become the property of Sir Mohammed Usman's father. And then you had yet another section which I am not very clear about, but I would I would assume most probably became what we today consider C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer Road and a part of TTK Road because the Sitamal colony, which is named after Lady Sitamal Ramaswamy Iyer, his wife, 
and the fact that Sleepy Ram Swami Iyer Road leads from there, I would assume that these were also parts of this property originally. But the property, interestingly, was bought by Sir Sleepy's father and Sir Sleepy's maternal grandfather. So C. R. Patavi Ram Iyer, who was Sleepy's father, and Sleepy's mother's father, Hansi Ram Venkata Subaiyer, they bought the property jointly from the from P. Chenton Rao, who was the Registrar General of the Government of Madras. And then the grove came up and the house was built sometime in the 1880s. There is a lot of information in the public domain about the materials that were used and how the house was constructed and all that. But suffice it to say that for this magnificent personality, this house kind of provided a magnificent backdrop and a setting for all that he chose to do in this city. It definitely lifted him to be an out of the ordinary person. So C.P.'s father, C.R. Patabi Ramayar came to Madras after having practiced in the Mofasil as a lawyer for some time. And then having come here, he came under the, pet, I wouldn't say patronage, under, I would call, Sir B. Bhashi Mahinga took a lot of interest in C.R. Patabi Ramayar's career. And initially, it is said that the family actually lived in Lakshmi Vilas, which is where today Kamadenu Theatre is. And that was the house of Sarvi Bhashi Mahinga, property of Bujiba Gunaidu before that. And that was the house where they lived. In fact, Abu Jamal's biography, Nan Kanda Bharatam, talks about the early years of C.R. Patavi Ramayar and how he came here to Madras and how Bhashi Mahinga helped him in the legal profession initially. But that appears to have been for a very, very brief period because after that, Patavi Ramayar bought this particular property and the family shifted here. C.P. was born even before the family came here. He was born in Vandibash, a place that we today know as Vandabasi, and born on Deepavali Day in 1879. So, a fairly colourful beginning, colourful and uh, full of noise beginning for a personality who would dominate the scene for almost a century. He, of course, studied in the Wesleyan school, which today is, which even then and today continues to be, where in Royal Petta, just opposite the Royal Petta Hospital. Uh, today, it's uh, three or four schools put together. The Wesleyan School is one of them. Then you've got the Emma Pauliger School. Then you've got the Methodist Mission. They are all together in the same compound. And that is where Sir C.P. studied. I do not know whether the famous labor leader, Tiruvita, was a classmate or whether he was a senior or a junior. But he would have been yet another famous personality produced by the uh, same school. And after having studied at the Wesleyan School, Sir C.P. joined the Presidency College, Madras, where he studied. And it is said that his father had somewhere read in a horoscope that his son would grow up to be a wastrel. All fathers read that kind of horoscope, I can tell you. And so uh, he was made to go through the most rigorous discipline possible when he grew up. Not a moment, spare time, and if when the father was driving to the court in his carriage, happened to look into the presidency compound and see his son playing tennis, there would be a letter addressed to the principal wanting to know why the son was wasting his time and not in his classes. And, but CP, I think, kind of, uh, later in life, it was a very hard-working life. That is the other thing that I kind of observed when I look at the quantum of activity that he managed to, he lived several lives at the same time. I think that all the discipline that his father kind of drilled into him is what really made him that hard a worker. Definitely if you look at the variety of speeches, the volume of writings, the insights that he gave into several things and of course as a leading lawyer he must have had to study his cases as well. I think he managed because of what his father taught him. Later it is said that he did not exercise that kind of discipline over his sons but they all grew up to be good boys. That is what he writes. Is that true? <laughs> so early in, C.P. Uh, was barely 20 when I think his father passed away and then it was up to him and his redoubtable mother, Rangamal, to kind of keep the family fire burning. C.P. of course started off practicing law as a junior to Sir v, I mean, Mr. V. Krishnaswamy Ayer and uh, that is incidentally a photograph of C.P. in one of his early cars with his son Pataviraman by his side. Uh, v. Krishnaswamy Ayer was then, of course, the fastest rising lawyer of Madras within a span of 30 years. He not only became the top ranking lawyer, he became a judge and then he became a member of the Governor's Executive Council. 
The last three years, of course, saw so much of action and he died at the age of 49. So if you look at it, I think he, he again, like Sir C.P. packed in a lot of activity into a very brief life. And C.P. became his junior and later in life would keep alive several institutions that V. Krishna Swami Iyer was to leave behind and we will see some of them. But even when V. Krishna Swami Iyer was alive and doing very, very well, and this was in 1906, you had the sensational crash of the Arbat Knot Bank. And uh, as is very well known, hundreds of people, thousands of people in Madras Presidency lost their money. Nobody believed that Arbat Knot would crash. And it was in October 1906 when Patrick McFadden, who was the partner of Arbuthnot Norton Company, threw himself in front of a railway train in Victoria Station in London and committed suicide. That his partner here, George Guff Arbuthnot, who was incidentally at that time the president of the Madras Club, the highest echelon of society that you can imagine, <laughs> he declared insolvency and posters were put up outside the bank on First Line Beach. Thousands lost their money, including the governor of Madras, Sir Arda Lawley. He became insolvent because of the bank crash. And the next step was to arrest Sir George Duff Arbuthnot and start a trial. The British were very reluctant to do that. And if you read the Hindu and the Mail at that time, you get contrasting views. The Mail says that the good that Sir George Duff Arbuthnot had done should not be forgotten. And therefore, he should be treated leniently. The Hindu paints him as a fian who has been eating up public money in speculation and arrest is what ought to be done. But finally he is arrested and then the trial begins. And V. Krishna Swami Iyer fights on behalf of the people or he kind of argues on behalf of the people who have lost their money in the case, in the bank crash. And uh, Norton, who is representing Agar, uh, Arbat Norton, says in just when the trial is about to begin that the V. Krishna Swami Iyer cannot argue the case because he is not a barrister. And so V. Krishna Swami Iyer takes off his gown, puts it on a chair and says, I may not argue as a barrister, but I can argue as a person who has lost money in the bank. And the court immediately agrees and that is how the trial begins. And the trial of course ends in the, in the imprisonment of George Gapar, but not for two years, rigorous imprisonment. But the crash of the Indian bank was to teach Indians that they could run a bank probably better than what any foreigner could. And that is when Krishna Swami Iyer along with a few friends starts off what is known as no prices for getting the name Indian bank. And that is how the Indian bank is started. And CP becomes the first director of that bank. He is the first person to sign in the bank document and therefore is accorded the honor of being the first uh, director. By then, he had a reputation like Ramana Maharshi in a way of being a Swarna Babu. Semaguri also had the same reputation incidentally. Anything that they started was believed to last for a lifetime and beyond. So probably Krishna Swami Iyer decided that CP's handwriting should be the first one on the bank's documents and that is how he signed because he was a very young man at that time. So, they buy up the offices of Arbuthnot building and they call it the Indian Bank building. And today the Indian Bank's head office incidentally is still in the same location though the building has been demolished. It is at the corner of First Line Beach and a place called Arbuthnot Street. Arbuthnot Street today is not remembered in name for obvious reasons. And uh, this, is, this is the multi-story building still stands where this building was at that time. Now CP, as I said, being Krishna Swami passed away in 1911 and CP had to, you know, then by then he had established independent practice. His, the earnings from the law is supposed to have been the envy of several people even at that very, very early stage in life. And much later he writes that he was even paid by the Nizam of Hyderabad, which incidentally is the exclamation of surprise should have been there at the end of that sentence because the Nizam of Hyderabad never paid anybody. But the CP managed to have gotten the money out of him, so that speaks volumes about his commercial abilities as well. And in 1912, Sir CP, or at that time CP as he was, had to fight what was known as the Besant versus Narayanaya case. And that really made him very, very well known in Madras residency. Ani Besant, having come down to Madras as part of the Theosophical movement, become the president of the Theosophical Society then goes on to convince Narayanaya, who was a member of the Theosophical Society, 
to part with the guardianship of his two sons, Krishnamurti and Nityananda, and allow her to become their guardian so that she would take care of their education, send them abroad and make them sahibs of the best order. So Naranaya, in the hope that his children will do very well under the guidance of Annie Besson, signs the deed, but later realizes that all is not well with the way the children are being educated and the children are being brought up. C.W. Ledpeter is the man who is entrusted with the education of the children. And let me say that if today Ledpeter had been practicing what he did then, Article 377 of the Indian Constitution would have been put on him and he would be behind bars. But at that time, Narayanayar found it very difficult that his sons were probably being subject to what Ledpeter was interested in. And uh, the Hindu was even more interested in getting the two children out because the Hindu detested Annie Besant, he detested the Theosophical Society. And in those days, the Hindu used to make no bones about people they detested. So it used to write very forthright things attacking everybody. And so what happened was that uh, the, at that time, Sikhi and the Hindu were very, very close to each other. Later on, there would be a bitter fallout, particularly in his travel court years. But uh, at that time, they were very close to each other. So C.P. ostensibly, on behalf of Narayanaya, becomes the lawyer and then files the suit in the High Court for the restitution of rights to Narayanaya as the parent. Comes up before Justice Bakewell in the Madras High Court. Besson chooses to argue on her own behalf. The the in fact, the, it is very interesting because the Hindu summarizes the trial on a day-to-day -day basis every day in the columns. Actually, if you go and look it up in the archives, you can read every day what C.P. said, what the what Besant argued on her own behalf and Besant was no ordinary personality. So she was fully capable of holding her own in her trial. The crux of the matter was getting hold of the syllabus that Ledbeater was following in order to teach the two children. And uh, Besant naturally demurred at that point and did not want to kind of uh, bring to light whatever was the syllabus that Ledbeater was following because other details didn't come forth. Narayanaya was very keen that Besant should be hauled up for contempt of court on that particular account. But CP, being the gentleman that he was, felt that you know the case was going well and contempt of court need not be a charge that should be brought, need not be a charge that should be pressed on Besant at that point. So Besant lost the case in the original side. Then it goes on appeal with Justice Oldfield sitting in judgment over it on the appellate side. And finally, Besant loses the case there as well, but prefers an appeal in the Privy Council in London. And that is where finally she wins her case. But by the time, it is well out of CP's uh, purview because he was not practicing in the Privy Council. And the other thing is that the boys were old enough to, by then, you know, like all good court cases, these things also go on for quite some time. And the boys were by then capable of expressing their own opinion and they were already in England. And they said that they would not like to come back to India because they found that their education was going in a particular direction. That was taken into account. They were made wards of court. And after that, the trial ended. Now, one would expect that CP and Besant would become sworn enemies after that particular trial. But that was not to be. In fact, CP writes in, in an account that he exulted for some time for having defeated the redoubtable Besant in a case. But then one day he gets a letter from her saying that right, even during the case when it is in progress, Besson praises the conduct of CP on many occasions. And at the end of it, she is the one who extends the olive branch and asks him whether he would like to get involved in her activities. So sometime in 1913 or 14, CP becomes a very close associate of Annie Besson. And one thing he makes very clear even then, that while he would support her on everything connected with social uplift, with the freedom movement, her ideas on theosophy and his ideas on Sanatana Dharma will never have a common meeting point. And so they agree to disagree on that particular aspect and everything else they kind of work together. I think in today's society particularly where debate, discussion and deliberation is not accepted, and if you are intolerant of my tolerance, you become doubly intolerant. And because I am intolerant of your intolerance, I am triply intolerant. I don't think these people could have been friends. In, in Facebook, I can see CP unfriending Annie Besant. <laughs> but in those days, I don't think that was going to happen. Yeah. 
and they worked very, very closely together till Besant's passing away in 1933. But it is not as though they had, they did not have disagreements even while they were close associates. For instance, this Krishnamurti was to be a bone of contention and his pronouncements would invariably irk Sir C.P. because he felt that this was not the way a young man ought to be brought up. That I went last night to Mesopotamia and I experienced what the Mesopotamian civilization was and today I have come back. These were all things that a pragmatic lawyer was not going to accept in any case. So they did have their bitter fallouts over several periods of time. Besant's lasting contribution with Sir C.P.'s great help among many was the building of what is today recognized as the Gokhale Hall but better known in its time as the Young Men's Indian Association which still stands on Armenian Street. Uh, Besant was of the view that someday India would become independent and when it became independent the youth of India will not be able bodied, would not have debating skills and would not be able to hold their own in a public forum. And so she felt that this is what ought to be taught to the youngsters. In CP she found an able lieutenant as in several others whom she had got together. So they put up what was called the Young Men's Indian Association in 1915. And in 1916 work began on the construction of the headquarters on Armenian Street. Gopal Krishna Gokhale, who was in many ways the mentor of all these people, he passed away that year, so the oratory in the middle of this building came to be called Gokhale Hall. CP was to be involved with the Young Men's Indian Association till the time he died. There is not one freedom fighter of worth who has not come and spoken in this Gokhale Hall. Mahatma Gandhi has come, Jawaharlal Nehru has come, Neta Dishwar Chandra Bose, Periyar Ive Ram Saminayakar, though he was not strictly a freedom fighter, Anna Durai, Everybody has come here and spoken. But today, the old men who run the Young Men's Indian Association, want, or the youngest age I think is somewhere near 90 or something like that, they want to demolish this building and put up a commercial complex here. This is the building that, Best, that Nehru wrote in 1945 or 46. Where will the Indian freedom movement be without Gokhale Hall? The voice of its founder, Annie Besant, forever will reverberate in its columns. This is what Nehru said. And this is what we have forgotten as a people. And we are thinking that by having 10 cars parked in the basement and a set of shops that call themselves Shop B, we have become modern. So this is the fate of... And it's now a roofless shell while the case is pending in the Supreme Court. The High Court has dismissed the... Uh, the association's uh, prayer that it should be allowed to demolish. The High Court has said it cannot be demolished. It's a free, it's a building that symbolizes the freedom struggle. Matter is now pending with the High Court. For the past 10 years, there is no room for the building and it hasn't collapsed. So, this is the building that they wanted to demolish saying that it was a weak structure. So, this is, I leave you with that thought. But I'll come back to Gokhale Hall in a few minutes. But before that, I must also tell you that Besant, having come back from England in 1915-16, launches what is called the Home Rule League. She is, in, she is influenced by the Irish Home Rule movement and starts the Home Rule League here and CP becomes an ardent supporter of Besant in that. The Home Rule movement does not have a medium of its own in the press and they really need to get hold of a newspaper. At that time, there was this newspaper called the Madras Courier which was doing very, very badly. It was, it's a, it's one of the oldest, it was one of the oldest newspapers of this city. And Besant bought it for 20,000 rupees in 1916. And she herself said, I bought it with money that was not my own. It was rumored that CP was the man who had actually funded the purchase of the newspaper because it was only he who had that kind of money in any case that he could have spent it on that newspaper. So from then on, the Madras Courier changed its name to New India. And New India initially operated from a road which we today recognize as Vasanta Press Road in Adya, which is just after the Adya Bridge. Besant was known as Vasanta in the Theosophical Movement, so it was known as the Vasanta Press Road. And that is where New India initially operated. But because the police was eternally interested in what Vasanta Press was up to, the Theosophical Society was not very comfortable. See, nice to talk about Brahman and Maitreya and all that. But if constable number 325 is knocking on your door, you feel happiest when you tell him so-and-so is not living over here. So the idea was that Besant had to move immediately. 
So they found property on second line beach which is called New India Building even now. And that is where the New India, the press moved. It was known as the Vasanta Press in Tamil and in English it was known as the Besant Press. And that is how New India was published for a few years. Now New India became very, very controversial over a period because of what Besant was writing. And so it was asked to pay a security to the chief metropolitan magistrate of 2000 rupees and an assurance that it would not publish anything that is even remotely seditious. So 2000 rupees was paid under protest by Besant and then she continued writing what she was writing. So one year later there was a demand for a 10,000 rupee deposit. Imagine the press was 20,000, this was 10,000. That amount was also paid. And then CP filed a suit on behalf of her in the uh, in the court asking for uh, you know the uh, money to be refunded and the newspaper to continue to print whatever it chose to print because he argued that it was not sedition in any way, it was only an expression of an opinion. In the meanwhile, Besant was arrested in 1918. And when she was arrested in 1918, she was sent to Uti, where she, or was it Kodakan I forget. There was a house called Gulistan where she had to live and CP had to run the newspaper. There was a judgment that the paper being seditious could not be brought out from a premises and therefore it operated from the garden of the grove under a tree which is still standing outside Dr. Nandita Krishna's house and there is a plaque underneath that which commemorates the fact that Sir C.P. ran the newspaper from that particular tree. It's what is called a Konnai Maram if I am not mistaken. Uh, in English it's DVDV. Yeah. It's a, you should go and take a look at it before you leave, if you don't mind. Uh, so, it, it's there, the fun. No, it's a, actually it's a more of a bush than a tree, it's a short tree from what I can say. It attracts a lot of butterflies if I am not mistaken in a particular city. So, that is the, under the tree from which he was bringing out the newspaper till Besant was released a year later. Now, Besant's return kind of coincided with the rise of Mahatma Gandhi and there was a strong difference of opinion on how the freedom struggle ought to continue thereafter. Because Besant and Sir C.P. were of the view that you had to go through a constitutional process in order to get your freedom. So, that was the moderate style of thinking. Whereas Mahatma was after all a student of Bal Ganga the Tilak and he was a radical and people were more influenced by the Mahatma. So Besant and Sir C.P. quit the Congress at around that time. Though both would continue keeping their involvement alive in what was happening in various ways. Much later Sir C.P. was asked this question as to on what grounds did he disagree with the Mahatma. And he essentially said there were three things on which he disagreed with him. One was he said this emphasis on Khadi. He said Khadi by itself is very good but you cannot do away with the fact that several other industries are needed and Khadi cannot become the be all and end all of the freedom movement. This was one. This was his point of view. I am just telling you what he uh, felt. And the second one that he felt was that inciting the students to boycott the classes. This he felt very strongly about. Perhaps his father was speaking through him at that time. He felt that, you know, this would lead to indiscipline later, which he, he writes, which could become an Indian trait. And that, you know, we would be always prone to protesting and not carry on with the work that we had at any given point of time. And lastly, he said that the Mahatma's lifestyle, now this is one thing, he was a prince in every way and I don't think he made any bones about it. So, he was that kind of a person. He said the Mahatma's lifestyle forced several others to appear like the Mahatma in public and then adopt a private lifestyle that was completely different. He didn't go very far but he, he even goes on to say there are people who drink whiskey at night and then talk about prohibition during the day. I don't have to tell you whom he was thinking about at that time. There was a very famous person who was imprisoned and the legend goes that he said that as long as you can assure me of my scotch, I would give up the freedom struggle. So, uh, probably he was thinking about that particular personality when he said that particular statement. Now, these were the three grounds on which he felt that the Mahatma was not really, you know, a person whom many people ought to follow, but that was his point of view and we should leave it at that. In the 1920, 
Largely at Besant's voting, CP decided to contest the elections for the Madras Corporation. And he stood from the Esplanade constituency. And by then, his court, his practice in the court had a number of Muslim clients. And this area of having a number of Bori and Ahmadiyya Muslims and things like that, they all voted en masse for him and he was elected very comfortably to the corporation as a councillor. And he was to remain a councillor between 1920 and I think, uh, so, uh, sorry, between 1911 and 1920. This was the time that he was uh, actually a councillor of the Madras Corporation. So even when he was a friend of Besant or slightly earlier than that, he had his interest. And, but they say that it was Besant who kind of goaded him into standing for election for the corporation. Now here in the corporation, he was to lock on continuously with Chartres Maloney, who was the commissioner of the Madras Corporation, Maloney, who is today commemorated as Melanie in the in Tinagar, M-E-L-A-N-I-E. That is how they write his name, though he was M-O-L-O-N-E-Y. So the only thing that remains common is the M and the L. Everything else they have managed to get rid of. Melanie and next road is Griffith Road. So you know what they were thinking of. So uh, Melanie, Moloni was the corporation commissioner at that time and he and Sir CP. What is very interesting is that the Ripon building was completed in 1913. Today we talk about corruption in building projects and all that. The first thing that happened after the Ripon building was over was CP and a committee of three investigated corruption in the building of the Ripon building. <laughs> and they found evidence that the contractors had been fudging the accounts right through. It led to the resignation of two councillors, blacklisting of three corporation contracts. Now I realize some other thing. There are several people who claim that they were contractors to the corporation. But then when you ask them why their name is not there on the foundation stone, they say, ah, the last. So I realized that there must have been some story behind it. But the first thing they did was they unearthed corruption in the building of the different building. And later, Maloney passed a rule that Indians would have to collect their garbage and keep it in the front signai of their house for the one day to come and collect the garbage. It was CP who argued saying that the Tinne is not a place where we keep garbage. It is a drawing room of kind, of a sort for our people. This is where they sit down, they conduct their conversation. It's a place of social gathering. So it's obnoxious if you are going to expect us to keep our garbage there, waiting for some man to come and collect it once a day. So the motion was debated and then Maloney's proposal was defeated. But today we all keep our garbage in the front yard only in a little tub waiting for the corporation man to come, but our houses have also changed compared to what they were at that time. There were a number of debates between him and Sir Pitti Thyagaraya Chetty, who was the president of the corporation in 1919. He became the president of the corporation. They clashed on a number of issues and one of them concerned the water in the duplicate Pastati temple tank. It was the idea of Dr. T. M. Nair that the public of Triplicane, if they are coming to wash their clothes in the Triplicane tank, they ought to pay for the maintenance of the tank. On the other hand, it was Tyagaraya Chetty who felt that that is not to be because it's a religious tank and it is meant to be there as a public duty. Now, CP supported Tyagaraya Chetty on this particular account. Nair and Tyagaraya Chetty were to fall apart briefly on that particular issue of the Triplicane water tank. But that was his tenure as a councillor of the corporation in 1920. He is clearly moving on to other things because by then his close friend Lord Willingdon has become the governor of Madras. Not much is known about Willingdon but Lady Willingdon was a bundle of energy. She did many things, many wrong, some right, but it could not be denied that Lady Willingdon when she set her mind to something would do it. And she found some people in Madras who were very interested in whatever she was doing. One was Raja Sir Annamale Chetiyar of Chetinad, the other was Sir C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer. These became very able lieutenants to her in her scheme of the nurse's home, which is today the Wellington Nursing Home. We recognize it as Wellington Nursing Home, but Wellington, good man that he was, had nothing to do with it apart from the defeating of Napoleon. Uh, he really had, and having stayed briefly in Madras, but it was Lady Wellington who was essentially commemorated in that. Lady Willingdon was notorious in many ways, but in certain ways she was good because she supported the widow reform movement of Sister Subalakshmi, helped her in setting up a school, provided a lot of funding for that and also created the nurses movement. Between Sir C.P. and Lady Willingdon, they would ensure that the Egmore Ladies Recreation Club would get 150 grounds in Egmore. 
so that the women of the city would be able to play games, all wearing nine yards and playing tennis, and cards, social graces, and become public figures. CP incidentally, far ahead of its time as far as women were concerned. When the debate in the corporation comes up about allowing women councillors, he is one of the people who says that it is high time we had women councillors in the corporation because they will bring about a different kind of thinking that men as a group are going to lack. Similarly, in the courts as well, he was always for women to become solicitors and lawyers and some of the writings, one of them being that today when so many women are dying of dowry and in childbirth, we do need women to espouse their causes in the law, in the eyes of the law. So these were, he was far ahead of his time in those matters. So as I said, he was very involved in the Egmore Ladies Recreation Club's creation and perhaps he suspected that in course of time, people who are interested only in the land would become very interested in it. So, he always, he put in a clause that the Advocate General of the Government of Tamil Nadu would have to be on the board of the Egmore Ladies Recreation Club and right up to the time of Govind Swaminathan, that was followed. Today, I don't have, I mean, I will leave you with just the thought that the Egmore Ladies Recreation Club is a tenant in the same property, occupying two rooms. I will leave you with that. So, this is what happens when men of integrity are replaced by others. So, uh, so, as, and so now to come back to Willingdon, Willingdon was highly appreciative of Sir CP. In fact, their first meeting was not a very positive one. That was when CP went to Bombay to speak on behalf of the Home Rule League and uh, Willingdon was then the governor. In fact, Willingdon had an unprecedented tenure of government houses. He was Governor of Bombay, Governor of Madras, Governor General of Canada and Viceroy of India. So a good tenure for 25 years at government expenditure. And it was said that wherever Lady Willingdon went, she accumulated bits and pieces of memorabilia, shall we put it, and took them back to England. In fact, I, uh, very interestingly, CP's close friend Bhima Sena Rao was the Accountant General of the Government of Madras. And when the Willingdons left Madras, Bhima Sena Rao was asked to do an audit of the government house. He went there and found several carpets and a billiard table missing. So he filed a memo. They were all discovered in Port's Head, awaiting shipment to London. So Bhima Sena Rao ordered for the carpets and the billiard table to be brought back. They came back. Nobody thought Willingdon would come back as Viceroy. He had gone to Canada and then he came back five years later as Viceroy of India. The first proposal was the King's Birthday's Honours List. And the first name for a knighthood, H. Bhima Sena Rao, Advocate, Accountant General, Government of Madras. So I believe Willingdon looked at it like that and said, is this the same man? And they said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. So anyway, to come back to this. So, but CP then met Lord Willingdon in Bombay and explained his time. He was a brilliant speaker as well, so he, Willingdon was convinced. That started a great friendship. So when he came back to Madras, he was very keen that CP should become a member of the government. By then, the Justice Party was already in power. The anti brahmin movement was at its height. And CP himself was very reluctant to join the government. At one stage, he had refused to become a judge. They had offered him the post of a judge. And he had said, I prefer to speak nonsense for a brief while rather than to listen to it for the whole day. This was his reason for not becoming a judge. And now, he decided it may be better becoming a judge rather than accepting a government job because he writes, and I am quoting his words, a Brahman has no place in the ministry in Madras. This is his, this is his very words, and I am not making any bones about it. He says, it cannot be denied that we are a minority, but at the same time, we cannot be faulted for the fact that we are educated and we adapted to English education. This is no fault of ours. But I must say that there is no place for people like us in this government. This is what he said at that time. So anyway, to come back to this, he stands for, uh, he is convinced to stand for the elections for the Madras Legislative Council, triple quick and constituency, and that is fair, Sir A. Ramsami Mudalyar was going to be his opponent. Good friends outside of the electoral battle, but bitter opponent as far as the election was concerned. At that time, when CP was going to give his speech in triple quick, he was told that people had decided to mix glass pieces with cow dung and then come and throw it at him during the speech. So he goes and buys a revolver and then practices it three times in his house 
and then comes for the electoral speech and keeps the revolver on top of the dais and says, this is the answer for anybody who is going to throw those things at me. Meeting goes off very peacefully. Because for all you know, TP must have been a bad shot. Other people didn't want to get killed. So <laughs> everybody decided to keep quiet. And so he won the election with a majority of, if I am not mistaken, 4,000. Because in those days it was not a public franchise, it was a limited franchise. So he won the election, but what is very interesting is having taken his seat as an elected member of the Madras Legislative Council, he is almost immediately made the Advocate General Government of Madras. So he actually resigns his position and becomes a nominated member of the Government of Madras in the council where he uh, he and uh, he then spends three years as Advocate General where he writes or rather is the others, others write that this is of course he with Mahatma Gandhi. This is, I should have put this slide earlier when I mentioned about his role in the Congress but I will come back to that. Now this is a photograph taken of him when he was the Advocate General Government of Madras between 1920 and 1923. Most of the cases that came to him were questions on whether somebody or the other could be arrested for speeches that they had made. And it was left to his balancing view to come up with explanations to say why so and so could not be arrested and most of the people incidentally when action was not taken on them because of his recommendations between 1920 and 23. But I showed you the Mahatma Gandhi photograph. One of the other reasons why Gandhi and he fell out was on the Khilafat movement which happened between 1918 and 1920. While Maulana Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali had come here to campaign for the Caliph of Turkey to be restored to his position. And CP had hosted them in this house, because it was this place. And because they stayed here, the Brahmins of Madras boycotted this house, leading to CP's mother bringing a Sastri girl from Kanchipuram who was brought up here and he became the family priest because nobody else would enter the house. Having hosted them here, he did not agree with the Khilafat movement and he felt that it was not a sustainable uh, issue at all. He was a bitter opponent of it. And so Gandhi and he, that was also one of the differences of opinion. Then in 1923, having been Advocate General for three years, he becomes Law Member, Government of Madras. By then he is knighted as well, he becomes Sir C.P. Ramaswamy Ayer. Having the Law Member's post incidentally was just not law. It had police, law and order, law, irrigation, ports and electricity. It's one of those eclectic combinations. Of, uh, for, a, for a person and he was to leave his mark on it because he, only he could have found a combination that suited him in all these things. For one, he said he was an electricity fanatic. He believed very strongly in the fact that electricity is needed. Then he believed very strongly in idle power being a good source for electricity. So he had combined electricity and the water. Then of course he was a strong believer in ports for increasing the trade and so he began to espouse the cause of the Vishakhapatnam port and the Tutikuran port while he was the law member government of Madras. But the big thing that he did was to create two electricity schemes that would completely transform the face of Tamil Nadu as we know of it today. And the first one was the Paikara water, the hydroelectric scheme in Utakaman, where he decided that a lake ought to be kind of uh, built and then the head from that could be used for hydroelectric supply. Most people made fun of it as the Paityakara scheme. But he went ahead, argued hard for it in the council and got the thing carried and finally Paikara became a reality. Once Paikara became a reality, the water and the power that it generated, particularly the power, began to transform Coimbatore. Mills began to be set up over there. Today we recognize Coimbatore as a Manchester of one time Manchester, today as an industrial hub. It was because of the electricity that Paikara, was, Paikara began to generate. Of course, small by the standards of today, 6.75 megawatts, that's about it to start with. But today, where is it? And then came the bigger project, which is the Stanley project or the Maytur Dam. Maytur Dam incidentally involved him having to coordinate with as much with the Mysore government as he had to do internally. And at that time it was as difficult to get the Mysore government and the Madras government to speak as it is for now for the Karnataka government and the Tamil Nadu government to see uh, reason. And one re way that he was able to handle the Mysore government's objection was to get Sir Albion Rajkumar Banerjee who was the Divan of Mysore at that time 
and he and Sir C. P. were very good friends, A. R. Banerjee. And the two of them met up very often and it was said that though each represented the cause of his own province, they conducted the discussions in an atmosphere of utmost cordiality. And over a period of time, they were able to get the project going. By then, Willingdon had gone back and Goshen, who was his successor, actually officiated over the first blasting of the land in Maytur to create the Maytur Dam. By 1934, Maytur Dam becomes a reality. Of course, CP has gone on to other things by that time. But what I wanted to tell you was that Maytur Chemicals starts off immediately after that and then comes Maytur Beard Cell which was going to make cloth powered by the hydroelectricity that was coming from here. Maytur Chemicals got into the making of caustic soda by fanning the salt that existed all around the peninsula region, taking it to this place, Maytur and making chemicals over there. Now this would have remained as it was had it not when independence came and Venkatrama began to spearhead the industrialization of Tamil Nadu in the 1950s, a lot of action was centered around the Maytur Dam. Because what happened was they had discovered bauxite very close by. So Madras Aluminium Company came up, started by T.S. Narayan Swami in this area. The reason why it came up there was one, aluminium needs a lot of electric power. And there was a hydroelectric power station nearby. It needs a lot of caustic soda for which Maytur Chemicals was nearby. Bauxite was coming in from the mines that was there in the Salem Maytur region. Now because Malco came up in that region, Maytur Chemicals had to increase its production. When it increased its production, chlorine became a byproduct and they didn't know what to do with it. So India Cements came up with Chemplast in Maytur in order to consume the surplus chlorine that was coming out of Maytur Chemicals. So today, if Chemplast is there and if Maytur Chemicals was later absorbed by Chemplast, of course, Malco had a long run before you know, it was taken over by Sterlite and other things that happened to it. All these things began because of the Maytur Dam and let's not forget the amount of irrigation that it provided for, amount of cultivation that it allowed for in the Tanjavur region because of the fact that the Kaveri was being dammed and the water was being released from here. Even today, it's a lifeline for the people of that particular region. When he was law member, he also had certain other tricky, tricky issues to deal with. One was the anti-Notch movement. Muthulakshmi Reddy had become the first woman legislator anywhere in the country in 1927. In 1928, she becomes the deputy speaker of the Madras Legislative Council. And then she begins the, she places the anti-Notch bill, which demands the complete outlawing of the Devadasi system. CP's close friend and political opponent, Satya Murthy, was all for the retention of the Devadasi system which led to bitter debates between Muthulakshmi Reddy and, and Satya Murthy in the council. In the meantime, the Devadasis of Madras formed what was called the Association of the Devadasis of Madras Presidency and met Sir C.P. as the law member. This is there in the Tamil Nadu archives. The entire text of the appeal of the Devadasis, I am, while I agree that the Devadasi system was all evil, I do not agree with the way it was outlawed without giving those women methods of trying to see what their children can, could do. Now that is something that is a topic of debate, but the appeal is one of the most fascinating documents because at the end of the appeal, you have got B. Nagaratnam signed in English, Bengaluru Nagaratnam, and on top of it, received on a particular day, C. P. Ram Swami Ayer signed on it as well. One document with signatures of two very redoubtable personalities is the Tamil Nadu archives. Then, of course, by the 19 th by 1930, CP's life has kind of changed. He's begun, you know, bigger things are calling him. He becomes a member of the Viceroy's Council for a brief while. He goes back to his legal practice. He becomes an advisor to the government of Travancore. And then much later, as you know, he becomes a Divan of Travancore. And for which, in which he had, in which tenure he had, he stayed on for almost a decade till 1947. The, uh, this is a photograph from the Swadesa Mitran which gives you, it's actually a series of photographs, I've just taken out one sheet and that gives you the delegates to the round table conference. CP was an attendee for the first and the third round table conference. This is the photograph for the first one. And uh, then on, you know, his career becomes much bigger than Madras, no longer involved in the activities of the city, but definitely a very powerful personality as, a city, uh, as far as the city was concerned. I'm just coming to the last 10 minutes of my presentation. 
Having become the Divan in 1936, within five weeks of becoming the Divan, he brings in what is known as the Templar Entry Proclamation of Travancore. And uh, where it recognizes that people of all castes can enter temples. And at that time it was considered a path-breaking movement. And statues were put up for the Prince of Maharaja of Travancore everywhere. And one of the statues was put up in Madras as well, just opposite the Raja Annamale Mandram, where Annamale Mandram would come up later. At that time it was not there. Today it is the Broadway bus stand. So that is where the statue was put up. The pedestal of the statue has the entire text of the Temple Entry Proclamation. And it also thanks Sir C.P. Ramaswamy Ayer as the Divan for having come up with the uh, proclamation. What is interesting is that while the Temple Entry Proclamation had happened there, Gandhi had hailed it, everybody had praised it, there were riots outside the grove. People had come to protest over here, they called P.P. Chandalan, they called him the P word, which say if I utter, I'll be arrested, so I'm not going to say it. And they called him all kinds of things, there was a boycott of the family, they had to manage what was growing within the compound for two or three days, still the rioters dispersed. And as Dr. Nandita's mother writes, the rioters departed taking an effigy of P.P which they burned ceremoniously at the Marina Beach. And with that it ended. And he himself said that the Temple Entry Proclamation had did one important thing. It united all Hindus against him. Something that it had no other movement had ever been possible. So the statue incidentally survived for years outside the bus stand. And then it was a urinal by night and several other things. Highly misused, posters used to be stuck all over it and all that. Much later, in the 1980s, I think, Semagudi Srinivasa here and a few others petitioned for the shifting of the statue. And today it stands outside the Ananta Padmanabha Swami temple in Gandhi If you go there, you can see the pedestal, you can read everything that is written around it. It's a uh, worthy memorial for what was a path-breaking mo moment in Indian history. He was also trustee of the Pache charities in the 19, between 1915 and 1918. And during that time, he he and several others who were members at that time tried to make this the college of South India as they called it. But once again it was the question of appointing a Brahmin principal that was lead to that was to lead to difference of opinion. There was an English professor called K.B. Ramanathaya who was the right man to become the principal, but his claims were overlooked. And an Englishman who was a teacher in a small school somewhere in England was brought down to become the principal. CP felt that that was an insult and he and others on the committee quit over that particular issue. The Subuna Vilasa Sabha, of which he was president after the time of his mentor V. Krishnaswami Ayer. Pamal Samanda Mudaliyar and a few others created the Subuna Vilasa Sabha as a counter to what they felt was a polluting, was the polluting influence of the drama companies, where you know men and women in advanced state of intoxication would come and argue their private fights on the stage and exchange colourful words. And that was the main attraction to go to those places. Of course, Sankaranda Swamigal reformed it by creating the boys' company. But Pamal Samadha Mudaliya thought of it differently and he decided that graduates will bring in a certain element of respectability to the theatre. And the curtain of the Subuna Vilasa Sabha incidentally had an embroidered picture of the Senate House to indicate that all of them were graduates and only men, incidentally. Women's, women's roles were also played by men. C.P. was a great supporter of the Subuna Vilasa Sabha. In fact, it is said that he even acted in a few of their plays. But as to which plays, Samanda Mudariyar does not mention, though he does speak frequently about uh, C.P. in his, in his wonderfully detailed but very difficult to read biography, Nadaka Meda Indian It is unfortunately not an indexed book and you've got to keep looking at all the pages to keep arriving at you know what you are searching for. But it gives you such wonderful vignettes of Madras and the theatre movement in this city that it's a treasure trove as a book and it is a must read if you are familiar with Tamil. In that, he talks about CP having been president and given them several ideas of how to transform their theatre group and making it a club, inviting more members to come in. And then sometime in the 1930s, he invites Samanda Mudaliyar to become the city, uh, the small judge of the small causes court of the Madras High Court. And Samadha Mudaliyar then becomes that. It, he says, you know, a number of CP Ramaswamy here in Arayapil Dhanan and the Padavi A train. And when once he takes up that job, CP also tells him gently that he'll have to give up his 
position of being the hereditary trustee of the Kapalishwara temple because many litigations will come up concerning the temple. So, Pamal Samana Mudaliyar quits that and he remains the, uh, he, he fulfills his uh, tenure as a, as a judge of the uh, small causes court of the Madras High Court. He also is a member of the Indian Officers Association and that is because of his brother-in-law, Sir Siri Kumar Shastri. Incidentally, CP's father may have been a great lawyer, but CP's wife came from a very, very high-ranked family of Madras. So, CV Ranganatha Shastri was one of the first proficients of the Madras University and then his brother, son was CV Kumarasamy Shastri and the daughter was Sitamal, the wife of uh, CP. He was known as Rowlett Shastri because he was one of the members of the Rowlett Act Committee. Something that CP opposed greatly but his brother-in-law was all for it. CV Kumarasamy Shastri was also known as the Mapilai judge because he was so handsome when he sat down in the high court to practice, to pass judgment. So he was known as the Mapile judge. Incidentally, the house, Kalamur house, is still standing in Sunday It is, uh, it is very badly maintained, but the house of Sir Sivi Kumar Shastri is still there as a testimony to the man's greatness. So they were members of the Indian Officers Association, and then this is of course a photo of the Indian Officers Association itself, and of course the Music Academy and his contribution to the world of arts. In 1927, Sir C.P. inaugurates the Music Academy's first session. It was not the Academy at that time, it was the All India Congress Committee's music conference held at this per time. And there was an exhibition of musical artifacts and CP at that time, Law Member Government of Madras, inaugurates the exhibition and gives a speech. And then in 1928, on August 18, he inaugurates the Music Academy proper at the Young Men's Christian Association on the Esplanade. And in his speech, he talks about his vision for what an organization like that ought to be doing and I think the organization has fulfilled that in great measure over several years. He also incidentally was the man who inaugurated the Bani Mahal, Tyagam Brahma Gana Sabha. More than all these inaugurations and this is, I think he was the only personality who presided four times over the music academy at various times. So this is when Paramar Neri Swaminath Iyer was the president and I think this is 1931. But more than all this, we ought to remember him for what he did for Carnatic music, which was the introduction of Swati Trinal. Without Sir CP, I do not know if Swati Trinal would have become an integral part of our Carnatic music world. So he becomes the Divan of Travancore sometime in 1936-37. And having become that, he then sees that already the junior Maharani Setu Parvati Bhai has taken steps to bring the compositions of Swati Trinal to the public. Harikesh and Alur Mutaya Bhagavatar is recruited by CP and the junior Maharani in order to come to the Swati Tirunal Academy in Travancore and begin notating the songs of Swati Tirunal wherever there are no tunes to set them to music, wherever some old ladies knew of the tunes to go and find out what the songs were and then bring them back and document them. Mutaya Bhagavatar was doing it for some time and then he was growing old, he wanted an assistant. And then CP decided that Shemangudi Srinivas Iyer would be the best man for it. In fact, Shemangudi says that when CP came to meet him, he told him that Whereupon I believe CP said, when I want the great Shemangudi Srinivas Iyer to come, it is only to sing and not to write letters. There will be enough assistance for you to take care of those things. So Semagudi moves over to Travancore and then in entirely in keeping with Semagudi's nature, ousts Mutaya Bhagavadar gently from his position and becomes the principal of the Swati Tirunal College and remains the principal of the Swati Tirunal College long after his tenure should have got over. Independence came. Everything. In fact, CP was attacked on July 25th, 1947, which was Semagudi's birthday and Swati Tirunal's uh, centenary was being celebrated. It was in a Shemangudi concert that the attack on CP really happened. Anyway, to come back, but CP, everybody left, Shemangudi stayed on. He stayed on, he was, became an icon in Travancore, in Tirunanthapuram, in Kerala. Even today he is referred to as Shemangudi Swami by the people over there. And he, if you cannot be denied, transformed the musical culture of Kerala. Today, Carnatic music thrives in far greater extremes in Kerala than it thrives here. Every village you have temples which invite musicians to come. A large part of that credit should go for that small seed that was laid by inviting 
somebody to come over and the way he popularized the music and the way he created so many students for himself in that particular region. Kalakshetra, this is not Kalakshetra, but Kalakshetra incidentally was also to greatly benefit from Sashipi, close associate of Rukmini Devi Arundel and also a member of the Kalakshetra board for a long period of time. Apart from all this, the he never, see, most South Indians are very good, Tamil Brahmins are very good in music, in reciting shlokas, but sports is something that most of us generally forget. But I think CP was one unique exception in that matter, a good tennis player and a member of the Madras United Club as well, which stood near Broadway. Incidentally, there is a bust of Sir CP still standing outside the Madras United Club. And it has, it says, Lieutenant General Sir CP Ramaswamy Ayer Divan Ramaswamy. That is what it says at the base. Of course, that is a very controversial phase of his life. I am not getting into that. When he was the Lieutenant General of the Travancore Armed Forces. But uh, that, the MUC has changed, but the bust is still very much there. The Sanskrit College, which was a creation of his mentor, V. Krishna Swami Ayer, he was to remain the president of the Sanskrit College for a very, very long period of time. Almost, I think, since the day he passed away, I think he was the president of the Sanskrit College. It benefited greatly from his uh, work. And then, having retired, went into self-imposed exile, post his Chavankur Divanship, retired to Uti, where he lived in his house called Dilai. But he may have wanted to retire, but I don't think the rest of the world was wanting to allow him to do it. So, there, embarked, there began a new phase in his life when he was to become the Vice Chancellor of uh, not only the uh, Annamala University, but also the Banaras Hindu University, if I am not mistaken. He was earlier the Vice Chancellor of the Kerala Travancore University, a one person who was the Vice Chancellor of three different universities at three different points of time, travelled abroad extensively. He and Nehru, of course, did not see eye to eye on most things. Nehru branded him a megalomaniac and said that, you know, that his role in the Travancore uh, period of his life was not something that he would like to remember. But when CP went abroad to represent India as an informal representative of India to America, the tour was such a success that Nehru actually wrote him a letter of congratulations, thanking him for all he done. Today India needs no introduction, but in those days you needed it. And so CP went and did it. Then, sometime when the regional language issue became very big, CP was to leave his imprint finally on the way we are today. And that is, he had moved into exile, nobody wanted him. Patel was the only man who wanted him to come back, but Nehru was adamant. The Kashmir issue had come up in the United Nations. Patel was very keen that CP should go and represent India in Kashmir. But they sent N. Gopal Sami Aingar, and as the story goes, he went as the accuser and returned as the accused. And, you know, we are still living to, we are still, uh, you know, living to see the, uh, you know, what happened at that point of time. But, in the 1950s, the regional movement became very big. The Dravidian parties in Madras presidency were demanding a Dravidistan, which they would like to break away and form. This was becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Nobody knew how to resolve it. There was a linguistic division of states took place, but even that was not going to bring an end to the Tamil demand led by the Dravida Karadam over here. And then Nehru invited CP to become the chairman of the National Integration Council. And there was one small innocuous modification that he asked for in the constitution of India. He said, hereafter, every elected representative of the country has to take his oath on the constitution and the integrity of the nation. If they don't do that, they and their party should be debarred from participating in public life in the country. The 16th amendment of the Indian constitution went through on this basis. Immediately, the Dravida Karadam gave up its demand for a separate Dravidista. Overnight, Anadurai withdrew the demand and said, hereafter we will fight for our rights within the constitution and the framework and the sovereignty of India. It required a small change and that is what he was capable of bringing. In fact, this is I think the last slide of my presentation. Ah, I would like to leave you with him leading the Sringeri Acharya in the 1966 Darbar in Madras when Abhinava Swami Vidyatika came here. This is probably one of the last few photographs taken of Sir Sifi because he was to pass away that year in October in a manner that was to earn the jealousy of everybody because he just laughed and threw his head back and passed away in London. 
But I would just like to, uh, the Kerala period, as I said, I'm not touching upon, and I do agree that it is a highly controversial period. The truth is somewhere in between everything that is written about him. But one thing that comes across this man is that he was definitely not for the hurly-burly of agitation and protest, but he was more for a constitutional method of arguing for everything, whether it was his success in the uh, major uh, you know, negotiations with, uh, with Mysore government, or whether it was his support, support for the Montego Chelmsford reforms, which where the Congress party was all for the complete abandoning of the Montego Chelmsford reform, while the CP felt that we could accept it and then fight for it for various modifications. Whether it was for accepting of dominion status in 1980, as proposed by Ramsey McDonald, he felt that India could have done that. And much later, he said that if we had taken it up in 1980, and accepted becoming a dominion. Jinnah was still a close supporter of Annie Besant. The Muslim League was several years away. There would have been no partition of India. And we would have got independence 30 years earlier than what we got. This is his point of view. And I am not in any way decrying what the Mahatma did. Certainly for me, there can be nobody greater than the Mahatma for all that he did for our country. But this is a differ differing point of view. And I think we have to give credit to this man for Sticking by his viewpoint, very few people have the moral strength and courage to stand by what they feel is right. Sir C.P. had that. Thank you very much.